Also during this time, you have more intricate development of uh, the Christian calendar. Instead of just the weekly services or maybe daily meetings in homes, there are more daily services in church buildings. Right? And so the opportunity to gather uh, with other Christians or uh, to go in um, to a uh, and have a bishop perform Eucharist for you, take the Eucharist or whatever, was much more often. Of course, it's unclear how many Christians actually engaged in daily worship. Um, but the offerings were there, sometimes even several times a day, for a person to go to the church building. Other important uh, parts of the Christian calendar included the Easter cycle, which is not just about the day of Easter anymore, but has now kind of blossomed in that kind of development between the 3rd century and the 4th century, and will continue developing. And so it's not just Easter, there's there's uh, the period before Easter, which becomes known as Lent. Now, there's some indication that some of the practices related to Lent existed even as far back as the second century. Um, you know, there's some scholars have found indication that people started fasting in the days leading up to Easter, which is what Lent was originally meant to be. It wasn't meant to be, well, I'm going to give up chocolate, or I'm going to give up television, right? It was supposed to be something a little bit more meaningful than that. Lent tended to be the 40 days, uh, sometimes up to eight weeks, depending on the group, right? Eventually it's kind of pared down, um, before Easter, not including the Sundays. So those 40 days don't include the, the Sundays. Uh, by the 4th century, it's a much more formalized procedure with guidelines, um, Athanasius, for example, uh, encourages congregation, his congregation to fast for 40 days before Easter. Um, it's still not the full-blown Lent, like the Ash Wednesday, when you have to watch yourself so you don't say, hey, you got something on your forehead. Um, you know, that's something that comes along in, in the Middle Ages. Lent, of course, led into not just Easter, but the Holy Week. Right? And so there's memories uh, and, and, and practices each of those days, you know, Sunday, Palm Sunday, right, the triumphal entry, Monday, Thursday, remembers, of, well, Ash Wednesday eventually, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and all of those are beginning to develop here in the fourth century. And the cycle extended all the way to Pentecost. Right? So there's kind of a, it's a broadening of remembrance of Jesus' death and Christian responsibility, uh, of, of remembering that. Other festivals will be added as well. Uh, the practice of epiphany, uh, so it, it's slightly different as the, the tradition of what epiphany is supposed to uh, represent. For some in those early years, it was connected to Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, right? And so, epiphany, Jesus' manifestation to the world. Uh, for some, it was the arrival of the wise men, which is quite a bit different period of time. Right? Um, but this idea of, of Jesus being revealed. And then, of course, you see the beginning of the development of Christmas. Um, although Christmas in those year, er, early years was celebrated at a variety of different times um, and had a variety of different uh, connections or dates connected with it. Um, for example, one uh, date was March 25th as the birth of Christ. So how did you get to March 25th? Well, March 25th, well, the first day of creation, people thought, had to be a day that was equal light and dark. So the spring equinox, March the 21st, right? equal day, equal light, equal dark, right? God created the light, created the dark. Four days after that, on, well, on the fourth day, Jesus creates the sun, or God creates the sun, right, in the sky, and Jesus is called the son of righteousness. So four days after 
spring equinox, March 25th, must have been the birth of Jesus. Perfect reason. But you might also notice that December 25th is nine months after March 25th. Hmm. So, <laughs> but with, with the December 25th, there also seems to have been the pressure during Constantine's reign of trying to take a very important pagan festival and trying to Christianize it a little bit. Uh, and so that, too, might have been the pressure as to why um, December 25th. Um, Orthodox Christians observe usually January 6th or 7th. Their calendar is slightly different, and so it's kind of moving around. And so why do they end up January 6th? Well, in the Middle Ages, there was a shift in calendars from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And so they shifted a bunch of months around. And January 6th was actually the old December 25th. And so that's why you might see Orthodox Christmas or something like that in the beginning of January when everybody else was celebrating it in December. So you see, even early Christians had no clue <laughs> what time of year Jesus was born. And they were much closer than, than we are. Also important would be uh, the days of martyrs, particular martyrs, um, or observances of days to the apostles, right? Today we remember St. Paul, today we remember St. Peter. Often a lot of those differed regionally. And so there's not a consistency. Like if you would look at, if you pull off, you know, Google like Catholic calendar of festivals, you know, there's a lot of days, right? But back then there isn't that everybody's agreed on this is the day we remember Peter. So basically they were just like a in that they found any reason to have a fellowship now? Pretty much, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, any day to kind of celebrate right? But But the goal, the, 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 the reason that this is being done is from positive one, right? We remember what Peter means for us as a church. We remember what Paul means for us. Or we remember, you know, Stephen's martyrdom because, you know, he lost his life. But yeah, I mean, there's also that, you know, you're getting together with people and, and probably food and and, and other things as well. We also briefly mentioned before about the development in the fourth century of Christian pilgrimage. People traveling more, especially to the Holy Land, right? the Palestine as it's called by this point, to see the sites where Jesus lived and walked. Of course, very important for a lot of those pilgrims was the travel to Jerusalem. And of course, a lot of this is kind of um, founded upon Constantine kind of bringing peace to the empire, but also the peaceful movement of Christians, so they have the opportunities to travel more. And there's a lot of interest here, and especially for those of you that were or have been on study abroad, Right? One of the things you did was go to these places and they say, well, this is where they think Jesus was baptized, right, on the Jordan River. And, you know, you might look up just a little bit. And that course group is where Jesus was baptized, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I mean, that kind of reflects the, you know, people don't know. But uh, even those early Christians wanted to try and connect as much as possible to this is the place where John the Baptist baptized Jesus, or this is the place where Jesus was born, or this is the place where Jesus was crucified, which is why you have, and Dr. Edwards kind of talked about this in chapel the other week, you know, you have the Church of the Holy Sepulcher versus some other places that they say, well, this is where Calvary was, or, or this is the tomb, but other people think, no, this is the tomb. Um, and so sometimes it kind of reminds me of that end scene in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, Right, when the Nazi goes in and takes this golden cup fit for a king, and Indiana says, no, we've got to take this cup fit for a carpenter, right? And so, you know, what, what would Jesus have really been buried in? Um, but, uh, you know, people are trying, even in these early years, to, to, co to connect to that space. Right? And, and I've heard several people that, that have been there, you know, about, about how you, you feel that connection. It feels more real, or there's, there's something holy about being there, even though you know that this might not be the real site, there's still something like somewhere here, right, Jesus walked. Somewhere here, Jesus prayed. Uh, somewhere here, Jesus rose from the dead. 
And of course, a lot of people traveled to Jerusalem during Easter, right? And one can get at that time to those places. We also brought up, and I think Chris brought up uh, Constantine's mother being one of the uh, real kind of promoters of a lot of this. Uh, she took uh, several trips looking for relics, building churches, so she's kind of responsible for uh, some of that. Um, but other people are doing it as well. In the fourth century as well, with the rise of monasticism and the influx of all these people from, from pagan paganism, a lot of Christians also became concerned about Christian discipline. Because it appears from what they wrote about, a lot of the people coming in want to be identified as Christians because of the political thing and, and because of the social thing, but they're not immediately adopting the morality of Christians. Right? And so their lifestyles aren't being lived out. Um, you know, many of them seem to have continued to live pagan lifestyles. Evidently, there were some, based on some of the writings of the time, who uh, continued to live as pagan priests. Right? They would, they would worship on Sunday, and the rest of the week they'd be serving the pagans. In the eastern part of the empire, there was an attempt to develop a system of discipline, a discipline hierarchy. Where if you sin, right, very public way, um, you had to face some punishment or penalties. There were five grades of people in this system. There were the mourners, the hearers, the followers, the bystanders, and the restored penitents. If you had fallen away, uh, or if you had lapsed in your faith, uh, you gradually moved through this system, possibly spending years at a particular grade before you moved to another grade, and then spent years there, before you were fully welcomed back into the church. So what you see here is, is it's not so much about the sincerity of your repentance as it is how long have you spent in this class of Christians known as, right? Uh, and so that's more, kind of becomes more important. These penalties become known as penances. It didn't work. People don't want to spend long years in the system, right? <laughs> so this kind of this idea of all right, we'll make people in you know, uh, doesn't. And so they kind of go back to the sincerity. Right. Um, and so it's it's kind of like sincerity replaces these long years. You know, have you, have you been praying? Do you show humility? Have you confessed your sin? In the West, there is still an emphasis on discipline, but instead of this very strict system of different grades like developed in the East, it was more about these public displays of remorse. Have you publicly demonstrated how sorry you are for your sin? Weeping, wearing sackcloth. But what was also emphasized, especially in the West, was the involvement of the church, capital C church, capital institutional hierarchical church, involvement in the forgiveness of sin. Right? And so in the West, it started emphasizing that you perform these public displays of remorse, but then you also had to have the official, the priest laying on of hands to forgive your sins or, or to say your sins were forgiven the priest saying prayers on your behalf, all of this is considered as part of the restoration process. The church, said Ambrose, has the power to forgive sins through the priest. 
Now, he would also qualify that and say, God actually does the forgiving, but the priest is empowered to act on God's behalf. And so it's nothing within the priest himself, it's because the priest has been chosen by God through the Holy Spirit to forgive sins. Now this system, of course, is much more advanced than what we talked about earlier when it was considered that you had one chance to repent after baptism. Um, you know, so this offers you multiple chances to repent. But there's still, still some discussion in some of the writings of the time about whether you only have one chance to repent after baptism. And that, of course, leads us to the development of hierarchy, the development of institutionalization, right? codified structures and, and levels and, and people, right? bishops and, and archbishops and priests. But one of the things that we notice um, from the times is there's often some immoral people that ended up in some pretty powerful church positions. We've mentioned that before. Part of that, part of the reason for that was rapid ordination. Right? To be a member of the church and be baptized, you had to study for several years, but to be a bishop, right, you know, it, it might be a much more rapid process. And often, there wasn't a clear distinction between those that you know, between paganism and, and, and Christianity. Uh, you know, the people selected to be bishop often didn't have that clear distinction. They might have muddied the waters some between them. As that starts happening, um, churches start to try and develop rules, limits, restrictions on who can become a priest, right? That, uh, you know, that you had to have a certain level of Christian education. Right? You had to have been a Christian for so long before you can become a priest or a bishop. The idea of the priest probably developed out of the concept of the presbyter as the Eucharist came to be more of a sacrifice. And so the notions of, of the Eucharist as a sacrifice is probably why you have the development of that term priest. Right? And so offering communion connected with the sacrificial idea. Previous to this point, priest and bishop had not been uh, clearly distinguished, which is that point. And we also mentioned the development of clerical celibacy. It appears that in the fourth century, priests and bishops were not allowed to marry after their ordination. So if you were married prior to you becoming a priest or a bishop, you could stay married. But if you became a priest or a bishop, you couldn't get married then. But if you're, you, were, you were married beforehand, you're ordained a priest, your spouse dies, you can't be married. Additionally, as we've noted already, Bishops are not just in individual churches now, they are in charge of cities. Right? So bishops are in charge of over all the churches in a city. And so a city might have more than one church, and now the bishop is in charge of those churches, which are kind of organized and ordered with the priests. Questions or comments about any of these last couple things that we've talked about. All right, if not, we'll close there. We'll pick up on Tuesday with talking about the Middle Ages.